Hello, Florida librarians. We're back with the first presentation of the third week in this online practical marketing class. I hope that you found the recent chat session and the material about market planning and audiences and messages and branding and print materials to be useful. Today, we are discussing word of mouth marketing. This is another one of the activities of marketing, the ways of delivering a message. And for libraries, this is possibly the single most important and cost-effective way of delivering the library message, and one that we often either ignore completely or take for granted. We don't want to do either one of those things. Libraries, in general, already have a word of mouth, uh, and your particular library does too. You may not know what it, what it says at this point, but you want to systematically work at influencing the word of mouth about the library to be both plentiful and positive. We want it to be favorable. We want it to be pervasive. There, I've said the same thing in two different ways. It's really important. The nonpartisan nonprofit Pew Research Center has done extensive professional market research on United States perceptions of libraries. And in general, people think of libraries as reliable, trustworthy, important community resources, part of the educational infrastructure. You can build on that research, that general way that people talk about libraries, with word of mouth strategies for specific programs and services you offer and that you want to promote. Now think about buzz for a bit here. Notice your own consumer choices. Even go so far as to write down each thing you buy or service you use in a notebook for a couple of days. Make two columns, one for the service and one for what prompted you to choose it. I would bet that most of the choices you made, you jotted down, heard about it from a friend, or has a good reputation, or I trust this brand. Those are all word of mouth messages that got to you one way or another. Now, some of the products or services might be supported by large advertising campaigns and ubiquitous messaging online, on social media, on billboards, on television. But the actual decision to spend your money or your time equally valuable, is based on personal testimony of some kind or another. Many marketers estimate that 60 to 70 percent of consumer decisions are made with word of mouth marketing as the primary force driving the choice. This is also true of library use. And in these days of Amazon, Audible, Netflix, Hulu, Google, and all the other riches, and in some cases quite expensive riches, available to us on a tiny device in our pocket, your library has to have the reputation for having added value, whether through expert help, the fact that all these amazing services are free, except for tax dollars, and easy to access, and um, a reputation maybe just for good books, or and this is key, a reputation for being a really pleasant place to be, whether you're visiting it online or visiting it in person. So people have expectations of a positive experience. You know, go to a library. You'll really like it. Our library is terrific. You would really like people in your community to be talking about you that way. Some of the other ways of talking about word of mouth are buzz, as we've said, or talk on the street, or gone viral if you're including virtual word of mouth via social media. Or there's the good old-fashioned notion of reputation. A good reputation is what? It's built by many people telling many other people and reinforcing the information and good feelings about you. Many intangibles are communicated through word of mouth, especially these enduring positives that libraries already have a leg up on. Trust, reliability, expert advice and counsel, welcoming place, and so forth. You already have hundreds or thousands of people who use your library in the building and outside who really like the experience and value your services. Harness all that positive energy. Think of ways to encourage them to talk to their friends, to help you 
get the library message out to everyone who needs it. In other words, Will Rogers, get someone else to blow your horn and the sound will carry twice as far. Now, we've always known about the value of word of mouth. This isn't a new invention. In PR workshops 30 years ago, we all used to suggest making friends with anyone who meets lots of people every day and talks with them. Um, barbers was code word for going to see those people, barbers, hair salon, stylists, grocery store clerks, all those people who see ordinary people every day doing ordinary things, and you want to get them talking. You want to get people to talk during their daily lives, and we want them to say great things to each other a lot about the library. Now, every community is different, especially in terms of where are the gathering places where people just chat. But this give, give this careful thought, and I bet you could come up with a list of five or six or ten places where you want to go visit and make sure the proprietors have information about the library. Or better yet, next time you get your hair cut, invite your stylist to the library. Talk to that person. Find out what he or she loves. Offer them a movie or a great book or a course in something. When you embark on word-of-mouth marketing as a systematic activity, it's time to stop and review a few things here. First, the library message. We talked a little about message crafting in an earlier presentation. Do you have a good elevator speech or a short way to say the important thing you want people to know about your library? Second, does everybody inside the library know how to deliver this message comfortably? Have they internalized it and made it their own? Third, is your customer service impeccably wonderful? It goes without saying that if you want to build a reputation for great experiences, it's important to deliver them. And an aside here, um, some anthropological research shows that humans are hardwired to remember negative experiences better than positive ones. And there is an old saw in marketing that if I have a great experience at your whatever, I'm going to maybe tell somebody about it. If I have a bad experience, I'm going to tell 10 people about it. So all the hard work you're doing, marketing and thinking about how to reach people, will be falling on deaf ears or be completely undone if somebody walks in the library for the first time and has a, a bad experience. Fourth, part of word of mouth is immediate two-way communication. This is terrific. As your staff collect comments heard at the information or cert desk or out in the community or in online comments on social media or any other way you can listen when people are talking about the library. This is important market research and can help you tweak your message or even tweak your services. And fifth, it's important to have a cadre of influential people who are library cheerleaders. We're going to talk about this more in the next presentation on ambassadorship, but keep in mind that influentials are, of course, the obvious, um, people who are very well connected politically or socially or financially. But there are many helpful lists out there of people who might be influential in your community. But opinion leaders like this can also be those who meet and talk to lots of everyday people every day. Again, the barbers and hairstylists, the butcher, the pastor, the PTA president, the senior, senior center activities head. Make a list for your own community. Please note that this checklist here on this uh, slide is borrowed from an excellent and usable guide called Building a Buzz by Peggy Barber and Linda Wallace. It's a book about word of mouth marketing specifically for public libraries, and I can't recommend it highly enough. It's really good. Now, once again, let's think about word of mouth some more. I, I like to go to the fundamental things that drive people, because I think it helps a lot when you're doing marketing. Why do people talk? Why do we talk? Once again, this is so personal, but if you're honest, you'll see all the following elements underlying your own conversations, whatever your personal style and whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. First of all, people talk because they really like to share their discoveries with other people. 
A simple example from a library experience might be, I just learned I could teach myself Spanish with one of the most respected online programs, and it's free on the library website. Or, holy cow, the library's open on Sunday afternoon. I can get there with the kids. Couldn't get there all week because I'm working so hard. Share discoveries. People also like to talk because they like to feel helpful. Don't you like it when you've helped somebody? You really have a sense that you've been useful to somebody? For example, let me show you how to download audiobooks. It's free instead of those expensive services, and it's really easy after you've done it once or twice. Another reason we talk, frankly, all of us from time to time, is to bolster self-esteem. You're identifying who you are, who you're associated with, you're part of something important. Um, you just joined the Friends of the Library, or we have one of the best libraries in the state, or I just love our library and I'm a big part of it. And the main reason we talk, conversation is part of the crucial glue that holds us together in our social humanity. Despite all the popular and scientific studies of differences in style, in conversational style between genders and regions, this is true of all people, male, female, rich, poor, urban, rural, and from around the globe. I talk, therefore I am a person, <laughs> is roughly what I'm saying here. Conversation, talk, predates reading, it predates writing. And it's probably one of the early human things that helped us to develop a sense of our own history and build technologies from generation to generation for the early millennia that we were evolving. So conversation is very important. It's endemic to being a person. Now, what are some things to do about this systematic encouragement to get people talking positively about the library? Again, be sure your staff, and include here your volunteers, friends, trustees, people who are identified with the library and who meet the public in the library, be sure they are sharing their formal and informal encounters um, where people talk about the library back with you and with each other. Write these down and gather the comments from all sources, whether it's online um, social media sources or what people are reporting. And remember that we are always building relationships, not just broadcasting information or holding forth. Stay fully aware of your listeners, your audience, and monitor how they are taking what you say. Some of the tools you'll need might be really simple. An information sheet or card or online page for staff readily available at all public desks on paper and online, especially if you use a number of volunteers. This is important. Confident staff know what to say to difficult questions. So build your staff confidence by being sure they're powerfully aware of what's going on and that they understand it and they know they're encouraged to talk about it. A very current calendar, what's happening, should be readily available to everybody. Uh, a morning meeting sometimes before opening. One librarian in this class described exactly such a meeting in our first chat session. Ten minutes before you open every day. What's new? What's happening in different departments? what to expect. This is a great idea on so many levels. It builds camaraderie and it enables whoever happens to be at the front desk to know what's going on in the children's department that day or in adult programming. Maybe your staff uh, is ready for a short little mini training on encouraging people to talk about the library, things to say, or on the importance of great customer service uh, to this whole endeavor. Internal email or daily Twitter about new things to everyone to generate enthusiasm is another method some people use. Um, ways of asking people, if you liked this service, book, program, whatever, tell a friend. We're here for everyone. I want to quote from John Cotton Dana, who is a real library pioneer in the early 20th century. And when he was director of the Newark, New Jersey Public Library from 1902 to 1929, it's a very long time ago, the book plate in every book said this, the books in the free public library belong to the citizens of Newark. 
The more they are used, the better for the city. If you find any of them helpful to you, if they make your hours of leisure more agreeable, your work more efficient, your enterprise more profitable, and your city more enjoyable, please tell others of the fact and thus aid in making these books more useful still. I think that's brilliant on so many levels. 19.2. Things don't really change that much. They look a lot different. The fundamental driving forces behind what we're doing haven't changed that much. This concludes our introduction to word of mouth marketing. Our next presentation will focus on a subset of word of mouth, library ambassadorship. And in the meantime, review some of the little self-examination assignments included in this segment. Pay attention to your own conversations over the dinner table, in the stores, at work, at church, everywhere. What are you talking about? And what are you hearing? And track your choices of goods and services. Think about how you got to that actual choice, whether it's a choosing a spaghetti or a car or a movie or a TV show or a doctor, lawyer, dentist, or a book to read or whatever. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time to start building your ambassador core.